Hello everyone, I'm Greg Smith, the Curriculum Coordinator for BioNetwork, and welcome to, the, to today's presentation entitled, Concepts in Cleaning and Disinfection of Controlled Environments. Our BioForum is scheduled to run from 10 a.m. until approximately 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Our panelist today is Renee Morley, Account Manager in the Life Science Division for the Steris Corporation. We're excited to have you meeting with us today, and at this time, I will turn it over to our panelist, Renee Morley. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for um, joining today. This is going to be a high-level presentation on the concepts in cleaning and disinfection of controlled environments. Um, as Greg had said, and if you had read my bio, I've been with Steris for about eight years now. Um, and I started off in customer service, working with a lot of the customers internally, and now I'm out in the field and I handle Eastern North Carolina. So I handle a lot of facilities um, in the Eastern North Carolina area, um, talking about disinfection and contamination control programs. So um, this is the agenda today. Um, I'm not just going to be talking about cleaning and disinfection. I'm going to be talking about other um, controls that you have to have in place to provide a sound, robust contamination control program. And that's what um, we call it, STAIRS does usually, we call it a contamination control program because that's what it is and it um, it hits every different part of the facility. If it's um, environmental controls, the facility itself, personnel, the products you use, et cetera. Um, so the first slide we're going to be talking about, or the first topic is microbial control objectives. And why do we clean? Um, it's for product integrity so that you can provide and facilities can provide safe products to patients. Um, historically speaking, the FDA was more concerned about the contamination of non-penicillin drug products with penicillins or the cross-contamination of drug products with potent steroids or hormones. Um, we hear a lot about microbial integrity, as we've heard, with the fungal contamination of the steroid in the New England Compounding Center. So, you know, different facilities and different areas within the industry are seeing that they need a, micro a sound microbial contamination program in place. Um, it also having um, product integrity because sometimes a, micro a microorganism that's objectable can potentially degrade the product on the stability. Um, and also a lot of, you know, why we clean is for equipment reuse, so that your equipment can be used for long periods of time. I work with facilities that are brand new and some that have been around for 20 to 30 years. They have to have these programs in place in order to have safe equipment um, or uh, <laughs> good equipment to continue to process these drugs. And then also, you know, we clean because of regulatory issues, the uh, 21 CFR, 211, um, we follow the EU guide to GMP Annex 1 and the FDA guidance for the industry from 2004. Um, and then going along more of the regulatory expectations, if you have one cleaning process for cleaning between different batches of the same product and use of a different process for cleaning between product changes, you should have written procedures to address these different scenarios and documented evidence of why the same process is not required. Some companies I work with have to clean with the detergent. Some companies I don't, you know, I work with have to clean with, just clean with water. Um, if they have, if you have one process for removing water soluble residues and another process for non water soluble residues, the written procedure should address both scenarios and make it clear with a given procedure which is to be followed for cleaning that different type of equipment in between batches. And why worry about microbes? Even in products not required to be sterile. I've actually um, gotten a lot of calls recently from the oral solid dose facilities in this area um, that they needed help with developing a more robust contamination control products or program because they have seen mold in their um, areas and they want to get rid of it. Um, the GMP, CGMP emphasizes cleaning and control of microbial contaminants and they also require appropriate written procedures designed to objectable organisms in drug products 
not required to be sterile and should be established and followed. Um, a lot of people, even if it's not an aseptic facility, they don't have the aseptic background or, you know, guidelines that they know that that they have to process this product, that microbial contamination is still an issue even if it is not a facility that's sterile. And the four vehicle, major vehicles of contamination are air, so the air we breathe every single day, water, which microbes love water and that's where they like to grow and use for their food, the surface of um, clean rooms in any general area. And when I talk about clean rooms, I'm talking about from class 100 to class 100,000. And then people. People are the largest form of contamination. So next we're going to talk about environmental controls, which is more of the facility design and how products are being brought into the clean room. Um, the CFR states that equipment for adequate control over pressure, microorganisms, dust, humidity, and temperature shall be provided when appropriate for the manufacture, processing, packaging, or holding of a drug product. And what is a clean room? A clean room is an environment typically used in manufacturing or scientific research that has a low level of environmental pollutants such as dust, airborne microbes, aerosol, particles and chemical vapors. Um, it's a controlled area of contamination that is specifi specified by a number of particles per cubic meter. Um, the temperature and the RH control is vital and um, most fac all facilities should have a 30 to 60 percent relative humidity maintaining it 24 hours a day. And then um, so I separated it into the air changes per hour for different facilities for the different types of classes of clean rooms. So for class 100,000, we see less than 15 air changes per hour, class 10,000, less than 30 air changes per hour, and class 100, less than 100 air changes per hour, or greater than, I'm sorry, that looks like a greater than. Um, and building faci and facilities, the flow of components, labeling, and in-process materials and drug products through the building or buildings shall be designed to prevent contamination. This is one of the first questions that we usually ask when a customer or a facility has an issue with contamination. The flow of the products is very important. Sometimes I see that, you know, the they have their changing a changing room that's next to the um, warehouse, and that's an area where contamination is prevalent because there's a lot of cardboard there, there's a lot of items coming in and out, doors are opening up and down, letting in different um, areas. So a way to help with this is, well, I'll talk about it later on in the presentation as well, choosing different disinfectants and sporicides, but a lot of people decontaminate the items that are brought in prior to um, entering the clean room. Um, so again, bringing items into a clean room. The items and the cart and cartwheels are also an area where we see a lot of um, contamination. Some people will use um, cartwheel tape or they'll use a sporicide. We've had a facility that actually um, created divots into their clean room and their um, the cartwheels just sat in the sporicide. So they knew that there was no contamination coming off of the cart. Um, when they move from room to room, you know, that's when you need to kind of look at it too. How is it going in? What areas is it going into? and how are you decontaminating it prior to getting into that room. A lot of facilities I see have um, dedicated carts and dedicated items to the clean room. Obviously, you can't always do that with certain things like raw materials and so forth. Um, so, you know, based on what your, um, where they are in the facility and how you're going to decontaminate is something that you need to look into. Um, Airlocks, pass-throughs, and dining rooms are also an area where contamination can be brought in. Since people are the biggest form of contamination in a clean room, um, the rooms are divided into a dirty and clean side. Um, they're cleaned to the higher level of the ISO level. Um, so what that means is that those rooms are also cleaned as well. And um, so whatever room you're going into, they, those are also 
clean as well, cleaned as well. So um, some facilities will clean every day. Some will clean at every shift. Um, a lot of facilities will use isopropyl alcohol in those areas for your hands, and then for um, so you'll wash your hands obviously first, and then you'll glove. You'll decontaminate with um, an IPA or ethyl alcohol, ethanol. Um, we usually, in this area at least, I see a lot of people using 70% IPA. Um, I see that the trends are moving towards that people are using an aerosol IPA um, and using that way or a touchless dispenser for the IPA on their gloves so that there is um, little touch contamination. Um, and then some people will also use for bringing items into a clean room, they'll use a sporicide first and then they'll wipe down with um, an IPA or an ethanol, ethanol alcohol um, if they see a residue on the items. And then um, one of the other things that we see a lot too is that the surfaces need to be easy, easily cleanable. Um, we have some facilities that have, you know, porous areas, and those are more difficult to clean, and they require a um, a longer contact time. And with that, you have to recognize what's easy to clean, what's not easy to clean, the areas that are hard to reach, um, because some people, you know, don't see that there are different parts behind some equipment that you may need to spray, or you may need to use a mop, or you may need to use a wiper. Um, apparel is a big thing as well, and um, obviously I'm assuming everyone who has seen a clean room and seen people in the process notice that they're wearing a lot of apparel and they're wearing a lot of things to protect their, to protect the drug from any contaminants that the body may have. And there's a lot of companies out there that um, will wash the, these and dry clean them and send them back, or where you can get sterile um, protective apparel and that sort of thing. And then usually the PPE, the regular PPE are hair nuts and beard covers, smocks or scrubs, shoe covers or plant or plant dedicated boots, mask coveralls or bunny suits, gloves, safety glasses or goggles, hoods or um, PAPR, power air purifying respirators. These are a big part too. Um, after they are out, after the person does come out of the clean room. Um, in keeping these up to a standard of what type of clean room they are going into. Um, you know, a lot of people will put their goggles in a, a safety cabinet and then they will use either UV light or they'll, they'll sit them in a disinfectant to sanitize them prior to being used again. And then a lot of people will just use, um, you know, they'll, they'll work with a company that will get their, or the, the outfit or the, um, Drugs or the smocks, and they'll send those out and they'll clean them and then bring them back as a sterile item. The next um, topic that we'll be talking about is personnel practices. And each person engaged in the manufacture, processing, packaging, or holding of a drug product shall have education, training, and experience or any combination thereof. Um, one thing that we've noticed is um, we do a lot of audits within facilities. So what that means is we'll go out and go into a facility and watch people clean, watch how they um, bring items into the clean room. For example, I've heard a story that um, one of my colleagues out in the area, he actually works in our technical services group and he travels all over the world and a facility was having contamination control. They asked Garris to come in and kind of go over what, um, what the issues could be in troubleshoot. So <laughs> he had seen that, you know, he saw a, a operator working and he saw a straw coming out of the operator's gown and he saw something dark coming through the straw. The operator was bringing in, um, had a Coke can in his smock and was drinking the Coke. So you're not supposed to be bringing in items like that into the clean room, you know, anything, people chewing gum, smoking, if they have, you know, if they do that, it's just a big thing. And they should have the education where they understand that. A lot of times, too, um, even teaching about cleaning and talking about cleaning, 
some people don't know why why they should clean, and that's one of my biggest um, proponents to a lot of the facilities that I work with. I you know I work with a lot of the manufacturing supervisors and um, directors of manufacturing, and it's really important to teach people why you clean and what how important their job is and how important it is that they're part of this process. So fundamental training topics should include the aseptic technique. Um, I believe every time, anytime you enter a clean room, this is required. CGMPs, clean room behavior, um, microbiology. I worked with a, cu a customer that worked with um, in a solid dosage facility, and what they or an oral solid dosage facility, and what she was really concerned with was that. Some of our people didn't have basic microbiology, and that's a big thing to understand. Sometimes when you think too much about it, you kind of get, at least I do, I get grossed out because I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's so many different microbes all over the place. But that's a big one to just kind of have in the back of your head and have that knowledge. Um, hygiene, hand washing is a big thing. I don't think, you know, I, I know it's flu season and we're seeing that you need to wash with a soap and then follow with a hand sanitizer, but it is really important to understand how your hands and the touch contamination is a big part of it as well. Downing, obviously you don't want the gown to touch the floor when you're putting it on and you want to have the appropriate um, downing, uh, uh, the appropriate apparel when entering a clean room. Um, and then patient safety, hazard pose, that's just something to understand when the um, you are making a drug that they know that any type of hazard or anything that happens in the clean room can potentially affect the drug product. And the SOPs. That's another one where we see when we do audit the facility, we'll ask the end user or the technician where they have where the SOPs are, and some of them don't know. And that's sort of a problem. They should know where the SOPs are if they need to get, you know, if the FDA is there monitoring them and that they need to get those SOPs to go over them with them, with an auditor, or just to know what the process is and what they require. We see this a lot of times with cleaning, too. So um, with all of that said, microbial control objectives, environmental controls, and personnel practices are also play a huge part in the cleaning and disinfection program. Um, so even with all those controls in place, there will still be contaminants entering the room. How do we mitigate risk and, and impact from those contaminants? How do we regain control? We clean. Um, a lot of facilities will come to us as well. I didn't really go into this in this presentation because I was trying to give a background of um, contamination control program, but um, a lot of facilities will come to us with how we regain control after an event, like, you know, if they have a shutdown or if there's, you know, um, adverse effects, like if the power goes out or if there's, you know, weather where the power goes out or there's damage to the facility. We also help with that, um, and there are ways to do that, and I can talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So an overview of cleaning and disinfection. Um, product selection is a big one. Cleaning frequency depends on the type of room you're cleaning. Cleaning practices, application technique, rotation, and rinsing is what I'll be talking about. So the different types of products that you can use within a clean room are sanitizer, disinfectant, and sterilant. So the one that you'll probably most see a lot is a sanitizer, which is usually the 70% IPA. And that's um, used on pre-clean surfaces unless tested with a serum load. So we, um, Steris tests all the disinfectants with serum efficacy to also clean. Um, and they'll give a bacteria reduction of greater than 99.9%. Um, a disinfectant, obviously, are the ones that you see, the phenols and the quaternary ammonium disinfectants out in the field. Um, and the proper use results in at least a four-log reduction of bacteria, um, target viruses, and target fungi at a 95% confidence level. Um, usually, a disinfectant will clean and disinfect. So that's the um, pro to be using a disinfectant. I've had some facilities that will use a cleaner and then followed by a disinfectant, which that you don't need to do all of that. Um, usually a disinfectant, depending upon what you're cleaning, 
um, you're only going to need one or two. And then a sterilant is, um, will kill all microorganisms, including spores. So if you've heard of a bacillus um, outbreak or there's microbial contamination, that's when you would use a sterilant. And they always require pre-cleaning. Um, I try to look at it kind of as um, that's something that you would want to, like if you were cleaning in your home, I would use, you know, like a bleach or hydrogen peroxide to clean that area. We don't, I don't usually recommend cleaning with bleach, um, but some people will use it. And this is just a nice little chart to show the efficacy of different products within the clean room that you would be using and then the frequency. So sterilants you don't want to use as much. Those are your high power that kill everything. Um, disinfectants you will be using depending upon the room um, once a week, once a month every single day, and that will be used on floors, walls, equipment. And then sanitizer are for your critical surfaces. And the reason a lot of people use IPA or 70% IPA is because it does not leave a residue and then it dries very quickly. So when you're sterilizing or sanitizing your hands, um, your gloved hands, it dries very quickly and you don't have to worry about any um, contamination to the drug product. The next slide, um, this talks a little bit about, this just shows a lot of the microorganisms that people test in their validation program. So I've actually gotten a lot of calls for revalidation of disinfectants because the FDA has monitored and has, um, you know, they want facilities to have every organism that they find in their, their um, clean rooms on tested on every surface in their clean room. So this is actually a very large task for facilities to undergo due to the fact that the testing is not cheap if you go to a third party. Um, it also takes a little bit of time. And it's also um, a lot of facilities haven't done revalidation of their disinfectant. So that's where companies like Steris and other facilities in the, or other um, companies and disinfectant pre companies in the area, we have products and we do label testing on them. Um, but what we recommend usually or what I recommend is to use in-home, in-house organisms to do this disinfectant testing. Your organisms within your clean room are going to be different from the facility down the road. And we usually recommend doing a more resistant, a middle of the ground resistant, and a less resistant. Um, we're always here to, I'm always here to help if you have any questions about what type of organisms to use, but you're always going to want to have a spore in there because those are what you want to make sure that you have to kill if you do have an outbreak. So this slide has a lot of wording on it, um, so I'll go through it. As, you know, and make it <laughs> as easy as I can. Um, we talked about the types of sanitizers with 70% IPAs being the biggest one. We see a lot of ethanol being used in Europe. Um, the two different types of disinfectants that I see the most used out of are phenols and quaternary ammonium blend disinfectants. So phenols have very good bacterial and virucidal properties on it. They're not as good of a cleaner as a, a quat is. Um, most, I mostly see phenols out there. I've seen a lot of facilities going to quaternary ammonium disinfectants that have issues if they're cleaning like blood or plasma or their blood fractionation facility or if they have powders in their areas. A lot of oral solid dose facilities like to use quats. Um, phenols I see a lot with the aseptic facilities or the biotech. Um, and then some biotech even use the quads. So it's just dependent upon where you see what organisms in your facility and look at the label claims for that and what products will work best in your facility. Um, and then we have the types of sporicides. So the biggest one I see is hydrogen peroxide acetic acid blend. Um, sodium, sodium hypochlorite is a big one as well, um, which is bleach. Um, I've seen a lot of people also use hydrogen peroxide which they're all great types of sporocytes, but I've also seen facilities that will use all three of these or two of these. The one thing that you want to um, consider for this is that these are products that can cause corrosion to stainless steel. Um, we've seen, I don't know if you've seen some of the 483s out there recently that um, talk about these types of products and 
corrosion within facilities. So when I was talking about the validation of disinfectants, we've actually, um, there's a 483 out there that the customer or that the facility got um, a warning letter for not testing the effectiveness of the disinfectant on corroded material. So that's another thing you want to look out for as well is that are these substrate compatible with your products? Um, so these are other con um, considerations. So contact time, supporting documentation, the availability, the cleaning ability, sterility of the product, rotation, substrate, and safety. Um, you can also get a lot of these products in sterile packaging or non-sterile packaging. Um, I have one facility that still sterile filters their products, um, or still sterile filters their disinfectants, but a lot of people are going towards using a sterile packet um, of the product, mixing it with WFI. So these slides are more of a, I'm gonna ha I think I have about three or four slides. These are general recommendations on how to clean these types of facilities. And this is a nice chart that our technical services group had put together. We ha I have um, a technical tip for you if you would like a copy of it. Just let Greg know. Um, I can send you the email that we have put together um, for general facility recommendations. So just to let you know, these are all recommendations. It doesn't mean you have to do them, but these are what we have seen in the industry as sort of um, a common thing that people have done. So for any, like the facilities, you would want to just, the surfaces, the different surfaces you're going to see, the method. Um, I also have another slide that I did not add to this presentation, which I found the other day. Um, but most people are using mops and wipes to clean certain things um, or to clean different items in their clean room. Floors, walls, and ceilings, people will use mops. Some people will even use um, foamers if they have high to reach areas and they need to get that contact time of that disinfectant or of the cleaner. So this is just um, for general facilities like your hallways um, where you don't really have any um, ISO standards or it's not a classified area. Um, this slide explains for the ISO class 8 grade D or class 100,000 closed processes. And these are recommendations that basically that we have for um, these different types of areas. So um, the cleaning agent would be a disinfectant. The sporal, like I said, the sporocidal agent that you choose um, is based on your EM data. So if you see that, you know, at different types, different time in the um, year that you have more of a sporocidal or a spore breakout, then you'll use a sporocidal agent. Or if you notice that every month you need to hit it with a sporocide, then you will do that. Um, most people, you know, in the summertime when there's more humidity and there's more, um, that's when a lot of people will use, well, at least in this area, will use more sporocides or they'll use them after a, um, a shutdown. The next slide explains for ISO class 7, grade C, or class 10,000, um, outside laminar, laminar floor, flow hoods, room, and halls. Um, these are just recommendations again. If you want to take a look at that and have any questions at the end, just let me know. Um, but it does cover the floors, the walls, the equipment, and any other surfaces within the area. And then ISO class 5, grade A, or or class 100 laminar flow hoods and aseptic filling suites. This is where you want to make sure that you are cleaning daily or cleaning every shift. Um, we usually have some facilities that will, or we do have facilities that will clean every single shift, um, and that's what you're supposed to do when you have a facility that is um, that has class 100 or aseptic filling suites. So the application conditions of a disinfectant sporicide sanitizer are pro is probably the most important thing that you need to keep in mind when applying disinfectants or writing up your SOPs. Um, concentration is a big thing. I've had customers call me asking me questions, you know, what, what if I add too much disinfectant? Well, you know, that's okay, but you, it's not necessary. You need to make, if you add too less, then that would be a problem. 
contract time is a really big thing as well. Um, I've had customers or facilities call me and ask questions and say, hey, this sport, your sport side didn't work. And usually <laughs> that can kill everything. Um, so what I usually ask to is, what, how long did you let it sit on the surface? So as we talked before, um, rooms that are class 100, that are class 100, that have the air changes so quick, these products will tend to dry. The good thing is that they um, usually have surfactants in them, which will help with the wetting of the surface so that they stay wet at a certain time. A lot of times I get questions where if they have any issues, you know, with keeping it wet, you just have to keep reapplying it. Um, to make sure that it is wet for that certain time. There is an FDA auditor out there that will watch cleaning processes and will actually um, use a stopwatch to see how long the disinfectant stays on the surface and how long that the contact time is and if it matches the SOP. Temperature is also a big thing. So in cold rooms, you know, we, we work with facilities that have cold rooms that hold different types of products. And um, temperature is a big thing. That's where you would need a longer contact time as well because it'll dry faster. The surface. So we have a couple of facilities. We've gotten calls where if the flooring's really old, then they need to clean more. They need to keep that wet more. Um, and bio burden levels, if you have a high bio burden levels or if there's different people going within the clean room at certain times, that's something that you need to keep in mind too. Um, water hardness, a lot of facilities that are cleaning are either using potable water or um, WFI or de deionized water. But usually if there is an issue with that, we can help. Or there are ways of getting around that. And techniques um, for cleaning disinfection, you usually want to clean from the cleanest to the dirtiest area so you're not tracking in additional um, contamination from top to bottom most critical to least critical surfaces. Um, we usually say apply the disinfectant to a wiper or spray on the surface, garden variety sprayer or mop. Um, the reason that I like to, to recommend mops are because it also gives you that mechanical action of getting rid of whatever is on the surface. Um, we usually recommend changing out the use solutions if you are using a two to three bucket routine. Um, every 600 square feet or 56 square meters in an ISO 5, grade A or grade B, and then every 1,000 square feet in nine, or 93 square meters in an ISO 6, 7, and 8, so grade C and D. Um, we usually recommend, or I usually recommend to grid or blueprint of the room, and this is how you can figure that out. Um, the pull and lift method is the method that we, that you would use if you had, if you were using a mop overlapping strokes by 20%, and then the figure eight, also called figure S, or unidirectional mopping stroke. Rotation has been a topic um, that has been around forever when cleaning with disinfectants. Um, there are some facilities that will use two disinfectants, um, followed by a, a ster sterilin as needed. Some people will only use one disinfectant. Um, that's purely up to you. There is only one study out there that says microbes can become resistant to disinfectants, um, and that's a lab study. So it actually was not put into real use uh, or into use um, in a facility. But you know, if if you're rotating with one disinfectant and a sporocyte, then there's your rotation, and the FDA will. Um, see that if you have it all documented of why you chose that. Um, I've been seeing a lot of people moving to one disinfectant rather than using two disinfectants um, because I think that they just want to have less products in the area and using different types to not confuse people who are cleaning so that they have um, all of the information set forth to the technicians or whoever is cleaning the um, rooms. So as long as you have a disinfectant and a sterilant, then you're good. Um, sterilants are chosen as needed or weekly or monthly. Um, we've actually seen facilities use it every day. Um, and then we actually had one facility using it five times a day, which is not good. Um, that can cause serious damage to 
the area and um, even if it is substrate compatible with the boricide, it's not good to use it and the FDA is going to look at that and say, you're obviously covering something up. So um, the next slide will actually talk about that. So the rationale is based on your EM data, if it's monthly, weekly, quarterly. Um, most aseptic facilities will use it weekly. Um, you'll see it more used monthly or quarterly for um, your higher grade rooms like the class um, 10,000 or 100,000. And then, or some just say based on, um, based on if they see an issue in the room. And it should be written in the SOP. That's why in the charts that I have provided, it says at the bottom in red, um, it'll say sporocyte use dependent upon your EM data or what you see in your facility. Because every facility is different. Um, and you may see that, you know, you need it at certain times of the year, like I said. So cleaning and disinfection, there's um, guidance out there. These are just some of the um, guidance documents that you can reference. Um, there's industry articles that are very good. Um, we have industry articles. So if there's anything on this list that you have an interest in, just let me know. Um, my information is on the um, at the end of the presentation, and I can help you get that information. This is um, rinsing is another topic that is huge that we get calls on or that I get calls on. Um, and when I talk about rinsing, it means rinsing residue off of the surface. So chemical or compounds that have multiple sources and that can interact negatively with the surfaces. Um, so for example, you'll notice it in a facility if they had been cleaning with a disinfectant for years and have never rinsed it off. Um, you'll see it and you'll see that it's a different color, it's, you know, um, discolored some of the equipment or some of the areas that it's been used on. So rinsing is removing those residues from those surfaces. And so you'll see in the appearance, the functionality, there's a product risk to it because it can flake off and enter one of your products, and that's not good. Um, and then there could be an interaction or an inter interference with other chemical agents being used. There's a safety issue. Um, one of the guys that I work with had actually said one time they had so much residue in a facility that um, tissues got stuck to the floor. So if you do notice that, you don't want that happening. Um, and then the rinse agents that most facilities use are an IPA or um, water, so WFI, in the facility. I have seen that some facilities will use it after every um, after every time they clean. They'll wipe down the surfaces with an IPA after they have had that um, after they've had their contact time with their disinfectant, or they will um, just do it every you know quarter, every month. Some facilities even go to be using cleaners um, to use a cleaner maybe once a quarter or every time they clean. Um, you can use an acidic, basic, or neutral and low concentrations to clean the equipment. Um, we. I've seen people use um, products that have hydrogen, that are, they have a lot of surfactants in them that are hydrogen peroxide based, and those actually also help clean the um, equipment. So, but the one thing to remember with cleaners is that you do have to rinse those afterwards with water. Um, you can't just keep that on the equipment. So, keys to a successful validation of a disinfectant is the antimicrobial agent, choosing the proper disinfectant for the job, testing protocol, practical, achievable, and verifiable, like we said, why and how are you using these, um, sanitation procedures, set up the proper rotation of disinfectants to control all organisms, and then change control, have all these processes organized. Um, one thing that I have noticed is that a lot of facilities will work on um, when they have revalidation efforts or if they see another um, organism within their um, within their clean room based on if it's brand new or if someone had brought it in or if it's the time of year that they see this, then that's where they have those change controls in place of how much they have to clean. So to conclude, um, contamination control is a balancing act. It takes all of these different um, 
components to create an effective contamination control program. It's not just the disinfectant, it's not just the cleaner, it's everyone involved, traffic control, facilities design and condition. Um, a lot of the facilities that are older, they may have to clean more just because it's an older facility. Um, traffic control, how items are being brought into the clean room is a big thing. Personnel, obviously, is a big thing. Um, and then cleaning and sanitization programs. So I appreciate everyone's time today. And if there are any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Renee. Uh, we have had some questions submitted, and I'm going to change to the questions that have been submitted. And uh, I'm going to put the uh, uh, put you back in charge here and let you go through each question of the five questions that we have submitted, if you don't mind, and answer those questions for our audience today. Okay. Um, what is the process for validating the various disinfectants? Um, so what you would do is, um, the PDA is actually coming out with a new technical report soon for this, and what they are recommending that I, can, I don't really know all the details, um, but there will be a lot of information in that technical report. It's been going on for about seven years now. Um, but the process is, is first you would work, some companies will work with an outside lab, a testing lab, and then sometimes um, facilities will do the testing in-house. So you'll choose microorganisms that you find in your facility and then some ATCC bugs, and then um, you'll do testing on the disinfectants at different um, concentrations. I can get you more information on this. Um, I can get you to one of our technical specialists that have a lot of information on this. Um, so you'll test the efficacy of the disinfectant through lab testing, and then you'll also do it in, in, in your clean room as well. Um, I hope that helps. To get more details, I'm going to have to get you in touch with one of our um, technical specialists on that because they'll have more information for you on that one. And, and Renee, um, Renee, you're welcome to uh, use my email. I'll post it in the chat box to uh, kind of funnel that information to our audience members today. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, um, because there's there's only, I mean, I guess there there's more to that question. I guess I would you know, want to ask more questions as to what is the process for validating the various disinfectants. Basically, you do lab testing and then you try it in your facility and you see which one is more effective, I guess, to make it a simple answer. But there's a lot that goes into it. The second question is, are there differences in clean room validation for a foreign company? Um, there are EMA regulations as well, um, but I don't believe that they're any different than what they would be in the United States. I would have to also check on that one. I'm sorry, I didn't really prepare that much information for the validation of the disinfectants, but seeing these questions, I do know that um, that is these are two different types of topics for validation of disinfectants that are um, you know, those are questions that I hear a lot. And that's a hot topic in the industry. So I can get you some information on that and um, check on that as well for you. And then the third question is, you mentioned contact time of disinfectants. What is appropriate and does that time need to be validated? Um, yes. So what people will usually do is they'll start off with the label claim for the disinfectant. So, for example, we have... Um, we have product we have products that say in 15 minutes um, aspergillus can be killed. So what they need to do is in your validation testing and studies, you have to test that 15 minutes, and if you can kill it quicker, you can also do that. So um, we have some customers using one of our products called Spore Cleanse, um, and they've tested to kill certain types of bacillus in five minutes. So that time does need to be validated, and um, usually people will, it depends upon what organism that there are issues that you have in your facility of what is appropriate. So usually we'll see 15 to 20 minutes or whatever the label has said. And then serum efficacy is where we use, um, it's a blood, so it's, um, so the product is actually tested to clean, and if the the microbes are killed in a thick serum when we are using those in the testing. 
And then the fifth question is, I found an EPA-registered disinfectant called Benefact that is plant-based and biodegradable. The company makes cleaners and disinfectants. Is that an acceptable product to use? It seems like a great environmentally safe alternative that does not require any protective clothing, gloves, goggles, et cetera. Um, I'm assuming, yes, if it's an EPA-registered disinfectant, it should be okay to use. Um, dependent upon what you're trying to clean and what you're trying to disinfect. And if those, the disinfectant has um, the qualities that you want to use and, you know, that has, that can kill those types of organisms, then I would say that should be okay. Um, it's just dependent upon what you're trying to clean. And there are a lot of products out there that are um, safe to use. Um, there, you know, every type of product you use, you know, you do need to have the protective um, the protective clothing for to use those that's just what I've always seen um, but that should be okay well thank you very much Renee uh, as we wrap up today uh, please take a moment to answer the brief survey that will appear as you log off uh, your feedback actually helps us to plan for future bioform events and, and don't forget to click the submit button when you finish and please note that today's uh, BioForum presentation was recorded so you can view it again. You will receive a thank you note from BioNetwork that will include a web link to the recording. Feel free to share that with your colleagues. And check back on our website at ncbionetwork.org for our next BioNetwork uh, BioForum event that is tentatively scheduled for April of 2014. Registration will be uh, available for this event soon, and it will be available online at our uh, website. We want to remind our audience that if you log on to ncbionetwork.org forward slash IET, you can take advantage of our free interactive e-learning tools that we have created. These cover a wide variety of topics, and we are certain you will find some of these that you can use. And if you participate in social networking, we're also on Facebook. You may keep abreast of topics in the news, future events, and other interesting articles simply by liking us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash bionetwork. Thank you once again to our presenter, Renee Morley, for uh, today's presentation. And on behalf of Bionetwork, we thank you for attending today's event.